Hi, I'm Bart Polson, and this is a lecture for Psychology 1100 Lifespan Development. We're looking at Chapter 5 on Middle Childhood, Section 5 on Social Development in Middle Childhood. The first thing we want to do is look at familial influences. So, um, during middle childhood, parents don't need to do as much monitoring they, uh, of the kids. They can actually, the kids can actually run themselves for a little while. Uh, they also can provide less uh, direct feedback than they did in preschool years. So control, so, excuse me, so control is gradually transferred from the parent to the child in a process known as co-regulation. Children spend less time with their parents, and they also begin to evaluate their parents more harshly than they did in early childhood. So another uh, question that comes up in families about maternal employment. Now, this slide raises a very good question. People often ask about what are the effects of maternal employment, but almost never ask what are the effects of paternal employment, because, you know, once upon a time, fathers didn't work outside the house either. Um, researchers exploring this question about maternal employment have found that it's not maternal employment, per se, that's linked with delinquency. Is it what does happen is delinquency is the result of a lack of supervision. And so... That being said, there's a lot of benefits to maternal employment, and with proper supervision, you can avoid a lot of these uh, negative things. So, for instance, the daughters of employed women are more achievement-oriented, and they set higher career goals for themselves than daughters of non-working women. Also, we should say non-employed outside the home women. Um, children of uh, employed mothers tend to be more pro-social. They tend to be less anxious and more flexible in their general stereotypes than their uh, peers. How about another big issue, and that is about having same-sex parents. Now, research has generally found that the psychological adjustment of children of lesbian and gay parents is comparable to that of children of heterosexual parents. So despite the stigma attached by a lot of people to homosexuality, lesbian and gay men are as likely as heterosexual parents to sustain positive family relationships. These children also show preferences for toys, clothing, and friends that are typical for their gender and age and heterosexual interests are predominantly found in these studies. So it turns out that it does not have the really uh, negative effects that so many people uh, catastrophize about, but instead it actually appears to be much of a non-issue. The next question is about divorce, uh, separation and divorce in families. The effects of divorce can be extensive for children. So most children end up spending less time with their parents uh, they also suffer from a lack of uh, financial, emotional, and physical support. Also, they're often deprived of activities and social interactions, uh, and their self-esteem can fall as well. A lot of this makes sense given the, um, the dislocation that's uh, in part of divorce and really that it is very financially stressful on the families. Also, children of divorced parents are more likely to have conduct disorders, drug abuse, and poor grades in school, along with a decrease in their physical health. We need to add very quickly that this does not necessarily mean that these things are the, the direct result of divorce because um, divorce rates differ from one group of people to another and the things that lead to conduct, sor conduct disorders, drug abuse, and poor grades can also be more common among families that are more likely to get divorced anyhow. And so all we can really say here, we do have this predictive relationship um, that... Uh, co-occurs. On the other hand, how about peer influences? Peers influence children in ways that parents simply cannot. As peers share interests and skills uh, with you know, their fellow children, they can also afford each other practice and social skills, and they serve as sounding boards for problems and experiences. So children seek, uh, children seek acceptance from their peers as a process of feeling normal. And this acceptance or rejection is important in childhood because problems with peers affect adjustment later on. So for instance, most rejected children never really learn to conform to these social norms. Instead, they remain on the fringes of the group and they actually may end up finding aggressive friends instead. Okay, now, um, children have differing concepts of friendship over time. So for instance, the development uh, of friendships or concepts of friendships starts as early as preschool and middle childhood, and they're often based on closeness and proximity. So we have here this momentary physical interaction. They just kind of, they're next to each other. Um, at these uh, early years, friendships can be superficial, easy in, easy out. It's kind of nice. Kids can adapt pretty quickly to things. Um, that is what's referred to as stage zero on this particular chart. Uh, stage one is one-way assistance. 
Um, people, uh, the children become less self-centered, um, but they choose their friends based on activities and, you know, somebody who wants to do what they want to do anyhow. On the other hand, by the time kids get older, you get down to these other levels. For instance, uh, level two, it was called fair weather cooperation. Or really just by ages eight to 11, children begin recognizing the importance of their of friends meeting each other's needs and possessing desirable traits so that they still look primarily for shared interests. That's what we have here in level two. The focus is still on self-interest. And, you know, it's in level three that you start to get this thing where the focus is more on what works for the both of us as opposed to uh, one person individually. Um, also, trustworthiness, mutual understanding, and a willingness to disclose personal information. These things characterize relationships in middle childhood and beyond. Also, children in middle childhood will typically say that they have more than one best friend. Uh, in childhood, also, boys tend to play in larger groups than girls, and children's friendships are almost exclusively, not entirely, but almost, with others of the same gender, continuing the trend of gender segregation that we find earlier. Last slide here is about uh, schools, and that you find that teachers can have a big influence because this is the time in the middle childhood when kids really are very absorbed in the school. And an effective school has several important characteristics. So for instance, there could be an energetic principal who builds an orderly, but not an oppressive environment. This is sort of like what you would expect out of the authoritative parenting style. Teachers should feel empowered. They should have high expectations for the children to learn. Again, like an authoritative parent. The curriculum at the school should stress academic. There should be frequent assessment of student performance. And then finally, students should feel empowered and be encouraged to participate in goal-setting, decision-making, and cooperative learning activities. Because these build into the social competence and the, uh, the personal development and you know, sort of what we call the ego strength of uh, a young child. And that's where we're going to end this chapter.